You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 26, sonnet 25. What if I say I'm not like the others? What if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender, what if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender, what if I say I will never surrender? This past week has been an education in podcasting. And the biggest lesson I've learned is that I need to build up a buffer if I'm to post according to any regular schedule. Unfortunately, learning this lesson and successfully putting it into practice are two different things. But as soon as I get this most distracting knee injury sorted out, I'm going to do what I can to start preparing in advance. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please, Sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Sonnet 25. Let those who are in favor with their stars of public honor and proud titles boast, whilst I whom fortune of such triumph bars, and looked for joy in that I honor most. Great princes' favorites their fair leaves spread, but as the marigold at the sun's eye, and in themselves their pride lies buried, for at a frown they in their glory die. The painful warrior famous for worth, after a thousand victories once foiled, is from the book of honor raised quite, and all the rest forgot for which he toiled. Then happy I that love and am beloved, where I may not remove, nor be removed. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 25. Let those who are in favor with their stars of public honor and proud titles boast, whilst I whom fortune of such triumph bars, and looked for joy in that I honor most. To be in favor with one's stars means to enjoy success and good fortune. Additionally, throughout the sonnet sequence, stars refers to the eyes of Shakespeare's reflection, just as they refer to the eyes of Narcissus's reflection in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Honor meant glory, renown, fame earned. Honor, dignity, distinction, position, victory, triumph, and splendor, beauty, excellence. Titles meant name showing a person's rank, but that was a relatively new definition in Shakespeare's day and originally meant inscription or heading and name of a book or play, etc. Triumph bears the military connotation of success in battle or conquest, but also spiritual victory, both of which are appropriate as the sequence is Shakespeare's attempt to fill the trenches of the sonnet pages with his spirit, which will from there infiltrate the reader's mind. Bars is understood to mean prevents, but could also have been understood to mean imprisons. This ties into the theme of Sonnet 5's Liquid Prisoner, in which Shakespeare's spirit is imprisoned in the text of the page. Joy meant pleasure, delight, erotic pleasure, bliss, or joyfulness. But from the 1580s was also a term of endearment, so we can read this as a verb or as a noun. The first quatrain of Sonnet 25 is intriguing because it can be read in two startlingly contradictory ways. The well-understood interpretation is that Shakespeare is barred from enjoying the triumph of public honor and titles, unlike those who were born under the right stars. But at the same time, the sonnets will always be in favor with their stars, Shakespeare's eyes, and this presents us with two alternative readings, the first in which joy is unlooked for, and the second wherein unlooked for qualifies the I, as in, whilst I unlooked for, whom fortune of such triumph bars. If it is joy that is unlooked for, then Shakespeare is triumphing in what he honors most, the sonnets, which takes precedence over joy. This reading is borne out by the later sonnets, who complain of the unfairness of their entire existence being directed towards mourning their lost love. If I is the subject of unlooked for, then Shakespeare himself would be the unlooked for joy, 
and his triumph would be in capturing himself in his sonnet, which he honors most. If this is the case, then it predicts the centuries in which we've been hunting exclusively for Shakespeare's supposed lover, rather than for the bard himself. Great prince's favorites their fair leaves spread, but as the marigold at the sun's eye, and in themselves their pride lies buried, for at a frown they in their glory die. According to the Arden sonnets, princes in Elizabethan usage could be female or male, which takes us back to the master mistress of sonnet 20. I've now invested far too much time traveling down the rabbit hole of Ovid's metamorphoses looking for references to princes, public, and favorites, and have had to call off the search in order to make progress with this episode, so I've resigned myself to scribbling down my interim results for another time. Favorite meant person or thing regarded with a special liking, but in Shakespeare's day also meant a person who gains dominant influence over a superior. Considering the connections between Hamlet and Hamlet, and Hamlet and the sonnets, I suspect that Shakespeare or Hamlet may be considered great princes, and the favorites would have been the sonnets. As I've discussed before, fair was likely intended to carry the additional meaning of artificial from the old French fair. Marigold is capitalized, and so I spent even more time poring over Ovid's metamorphoses, and the only related story I could find was the story of King Midas. After Bacchus granted King Midas his wish to turn everything he touched into gold, the king is described as rejoicing in his harm away full merry, and later Phoebus punishes him with ass's ears for having poor taste in music, which is clearly the inspiration for Bottom's transformation in A Midsummer Night's Dream. I've read elsewhere the story that Midas' daughter was named Zoe, or Marigold, and was accidentally turned into gold by her father. But that version is not from Ovid, and so I cannot be sure of Shakespeare's familiarity with it. Just as I found a story about Caltha staring at Phoebus and melting into a marigold, but I've no idea where these stories come from or how far back they originated. The marigold also happens to be the flower of Dia de Muertos, or Dia de los Muertos, which I'm fairly confident Shakespeare wouldn't have been familiar with. The symbolism of flowers also poses difficulties when it comes to discovering their origins, and the we-don't-need-to-cite-our-sources internets inform me that marigold symbolizes cruelty, grief, jealousy, and passion. All of these fit the sonnets well, but I can't verify that any of them would have been familiar in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Arden sonnet states that the acknowledged characteristic of the Elizabethan marigold was that it opened and closed in response to the sun. As discussed in the previous episode, the sun could refer to the light that pours onto the page whenever the reader opens the book of sonnets. Here, this happens when the leaves or pages are spread, and just like the marigold flower, they are buried amongst themselves whenever the sun ceases to shine. The only other likely meaning I can take from marigold was that the early Christians originally put flowers on Mary's altar in place of coins, hence its name. Apparently, in Victorian times, the flower represented the desire for riches due to its association with coins, so perhaps there's some relevance here with the already established themes of status, of graves, and of alchemical gold. In the Arden sonnets, Catherine Duncan Jones connects this quatrain with sonnet one's Within thine own bud buriest thy content, which seems apt. What all that background tells us about the second quatrain is that in addition to a straightforward reading of those lucky few have only a short time to enjoy their good fortune, we can also read Shakespeare's favorites, the sonnets, spread their pages, but only live gloriously as long as they entertain the reader. The painful warrior famous for worth, after a thousand victories once foiled, is from the book of honor raised quite, and all the rest forgot for which he toiled. Painful warrior is an important term, as painful meant full of difficulty, woe, suffering, punishment, from the old French, and warrior is a continuation of the established military theme. Famous appears to have meant made famous, and worth meant value, price, price paid, worth, worthiness, or merit. I don't believe that there are any typos in the sonnet sequence, and it astounds me that many critics and publishers have replaced one or other of the words worth and quite because they don't rhyme. I cannot help but wonder if the thousand victories might be the successful rhymes that precede this quatrain, and this one mistake here erases this history of success, 
and is highlighted by the comment in the Arden Sonnets, it is possible that Shakespeare, never a brilliant rhymester, left these lines imperfect. I can't even tell whether or not Catherine Duncan Jones intended the statement to be ironic, considering just how incredibly well he rhymes throughout his works. Foiled is interesting because we automatically read it as to be defeated, but it also meant leaf, foliage, sheet of paper, or sheet of metal from the old French, and from the 1580s carried the sense of one who enhances another by contrast. This, combined with the use of the word raised, which can be read as erased as well as to be raised up, provides another contrasting reading for the third quatrain. On the surface, the third quatrain appears to be a reference to some known tale or an amalgamation of known tales, and tells the story of how a single mistake can destroy one's reputation and legacy. But bearing in mind that Shakespeare never published any of his plays, we can also read it as follows. Once Shakespeare, the sorrowful warrior famed for his many victories as a playwright, has been embedded in the pages of the sequence, he will be raised up from this book of honor, and those plays and everything else that he worked for would quickly be forgotten, at least for the duration of the reading. Then happy I that love and am beloved, where I may not remove, nor be removed. Remove meant move, take away, or dismiss, from the old French, move, stir, leave, depart, or take away. In the traditional reading, Shakespeare is not like those lucky highborns, and must seek his fortune elsewhere. Those princes and favorites are doomed to lose everything at their first signs of being unworthy. But still, Shakespeare is happy to love and be loved by his sonnets, where, once published, his existence, his reputation, and his love will be fixed for all eternity. In the second reading that I'm proposing here, Shakespeare enjoys his own triumphs, the sonnets, but they, like the great prince's favorites, only get to enjoy the sun as long as they're enjoyed by their readers. Once Shakespeare wraps his spirit with the pages and words of the sonnets, his buried pride will be raised from this honored book, and the reader will forget everything but the world that the sonnet describes, and the sonnets will be happy that they both love and are loved from a place in which they are fixed and motionless and cannot be removed. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not like like the others? others? What if I say I'm I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender, what if I say I will never surrender?